Hello, and welcome to Sit and Listen, a production of Science in the News. I'm Sanjana. I'm Shantam. I'm Edward. And we are all graduate students at Harvard University. Today's episode is on data literacy and how to spot everyday misinformation. Data literacy is crucial nowadays because technology is advanced enough for us to acquire large amounts of data quickly and share it even faster on social media. This information can be very difficult to refute when it contains numbers. So how can we recognize false or misleading claims that we encounter every day? What are some common pitfalls of data interpretation? Can we do our own fact-checking? Joining us today to answer these questions are Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West, professors at the University of Washington in Seattle and authors of a new book, Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World. Carl and Jevin, welcome. It's great to have you here. Can you give us a little bit about who you are? Carl, yeah. you want to go first? Go ahead. Sure, sure. I'm Carl Bergstrom. I'm a professor of biology at the University of Washington. i um, been here for uh, about 20 years. Um, this, is my, this is my first uh, faculty position after, after my postdoc, and I loved it here. And, uh, well, Jevin, why don't you say who you are? Sure. So um, my name is Jevin West. I'm an associate professor in the information school. It's a kind of a department that mixes together economists, computer scientists, philosophers, historians, et cetera, around uh, at that interface of technology and humans. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the role that data plays at that interface. And I've been here since about 2013. And like Carl, got here and, and love what we do here at uh, UW in Seattle. That's wonderful. Thanks. Do you want to both speak a little bit about what classes you teach? So I teach classes mostly in the data science area. So I teach classes, uh, I teach a machine learning class, I teach a data engineering class, I see, teach a, a kind of an introductory statistics class, um, which kind of mixes in a little econometrics. Most of the work I do is around data, the research and teaching. Uh, but I also teach classes, like last year I taught, taught a class on global disinformation. I've taught special topics courses, uh, you know, on research methods, things like that. But my favorite class, of course, is the course I teach with Carl. And I actually, it's one of those courses where at the end, we had our last lecture last week. And both of us kind of look at each other and we're like, is this really the last week? Whereas sometimes you're so tired from the course, not that you don't want to be teaching, but you're like, whew, need a break. With the, with the calling uh, bullshit course, it's one that, uh, you know, I, I, I could teach every week. It's so much fun. Yeah, it is really, really fun. Um, that, so they, uh, that's, that's one of the ones I teach. The other things I teach are, uh, you know, I teach, uh, right now I'm teaching a class on evolution and medicine where we try to understand the role of evolutionary biology in informing medical research and even medical practice in some cases. Look at some of the big developments in the way that evolutionary thinking has changed the practice of medicine. For example, in the treatment of cancer, the ways that uh, evolutionary biology comes into fighting COVID and all of that kind of stuff. Um, in the past, I've taught classes in a whole bunch of areas, uh, you know, stochastic processes. I love teaching a game theory class, taught infectious disease modeling classes, a wide range of things. Thanks. Is there maybe one specific and interesting takeaway from the evolution of medicine class that you'd like to share with us today? Oh, boy. Um, let's see. Yes, there is. But I should figure out what I should figure out what it is. Yeah, it's that uh, it's that diseases are not themselves adaptations of course so like you know that you know like looking for the adaptive significance of uh, diabetes or something like that is a fool's errand but the vulnerability to disease is something that we can ask uh, evolutionary questions about why is natural selection left us vulnerable to particular diseases and there are a whole bunch of interesting reasons that we can think about you know sometimes natural selection can't uh, act fast enough to keep up with uh, with evolving parasites or with massive changes in our a way of living. Some, there's some things, you know, natural selection just doesn't have the foresight to, uh, you know, for example, design a spine that works well once apes decide to walk around upright. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of different, sometimes things that we think of as diseases or, or pathologies are actually defenses, things like fever and anxiety. So, you know, those are the sorts of things we think about in the class. That's really interesting. I think people would particularly be interested in that because of the current pandemic. Yeah. Moving on a little bit, what are your research interests? Do you collaborate within your research? Kevin? Oh my goodness, yes. I feel like I'm uh, one of these researchers that spans multiple fields, but Carl is one of the more transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, whatever you want to, and I'll let him speak for it. But, but, you know, it's hard to actually say what is in what area. But if I had to sort of name one specific area, it would probably be um, in this emerging area of what's called science of science uh, with applying some of the data science skills and tools and methods that have emerged over the last 
couple of decades and data sets that have become available. That's probably one of the, the major areas. And then the other major area, of course, is the study of misinformation. There's an emerging field that's been forming for the last you know, half a decade or so that has spent time looking at not just the ways in which good information goes viral and spreads across our literatures and our social media feeds, et cetera, but to look at the ways in which wrong pieces of information um, get amplified, how individual actors get amplified, sometimes accidentally, sometimes on purpose, um, and trying to figure out ways to intervene um, in that, you know, these misinformation environments with respect to things like the First Amendment and the allowing of ideas to be clashing together um, and not just trying to shut down all communication. So anyway, th- so I would say two major areas for me are science of science within sort of with sort of a strong crossover with data science and then um, this emerging field of misinformation studies. Yeah, and I'm interested in how information flows through biological systems and through social systems. And I'm kind of working at that and, you know, on those sorts of questions in many different scales and many different levels. Been really interested for a long time in how information works in biology, not only the sort of evolution of signaling, but also the how natural selection as a process actually incorporates information about the world into the genomes of organisms. Can we write down sort of a mathematics of the way that information uh, or the way that natural selection operates as an information gathering process, if you will? I got a lot of background in epidemiology. I spent, you know, over a decade working essentially on thinking about you know, planning for emerging respiratory pandemics. Um, then I've gotten, of course, obviously because of that, pulled back into doing epidemiology pretty much full time ever since the, the emergence of COVID. Prior to COVID uh, and, and at some point, you know, post COVID, my big interests were really around the misinformation work that Jevin is talking about. That's something we've found our way into together. And then also uh, in, a, in a related area of science of science, and my perspective is a little bit different than Jevin's. He's really working on, you know, data analysis using using amazing large data sets from, from databases of all the publications ever in, in science and things like that. I'm thinking very much about the sort of the uh, what sometimes described as the, the new economics of science, which is one of these bad names like next generation sequencing that that was good when it came out, but now is old. Um, so it makes no sense. But the new economics of science was a way to sort of think about how scientists are not these sort of, you know, idealized actors that are just purely seeking knowledge, but rather are, you know, economic agents that are making decisions based on the incentives that they're f- confronted with. And so thinking about how the incentive structure of science leads to people making certain choices about what to study, what to publish, what kind of research directions to take, and ultimately determines what we know about the world and what we don't. And Edward, if it's okay, I'm going to give you a slightly different answer based on uh, being inspired by Carl's answer, less about fields. So, of course, you know, we've all published in lots of fields. I mean, I publish in computer science, like biology, you know, HCI, sociology, et cetera. But What drives me as a researcher is um, the moment we're in, at least when it comes to communication in society, both in science and outside science. And the digitization that occurred, you know, in the early 2000s, late 1990s has really transformed how we do science for better and for worse. In some ways, it's really um, enhanced the way that we innovate and ask questions and the kind of research that we can do. But we're at a moment now where science is really at a point where it can go lots of different directions based on the policies we create, the way we communicate, the way we reward science. So there's this moment in in human history where the way that we communicate at this large scale has really transformed dramatically. And we're there kind of studying it right now. That's what we study. And then trying to come up with ways to ask questions about that moment and then think about interventions when it comes to things like misinformation. Right. Thank you. Now let's move into some questions about the book. Carl and Jevin recently published Calling Bullshit, which is based on the course they teach at the University of Washington. Starting at the beginning, what is bullshit or misinformation and what's uniquely difficult about quantitative misinformation? Jeff and I spent a fair bit of time thinking about uh, what our own definition is. And it would be something like, you know, for us, bullshit is language, statistical figures, data graphics, other forms of presentation that are intended to persuade someone by impressing or overwhelming them with a blatant disregard for the truth or the logical coherence of what's being presented. So it's really that notion that uh, I don't care about communicating effectively accurate things to you. I, I'm just trying to impress you or overwhelm you or make um, uh, w- without trying to be informative in, a, in any kind of a useful way. 
And, and what our book is about is, is really about uh, the way that bullshit has gone from being sort of, you know, showy words and the sorts of things that advertisers or politicians say to being very heavily quantitative. And that's a particular threat because we, we can learn, we, we all know or learn pretty quickly to see through bullshit words, but we're much less quick to challenge numbers for a bunch of different reasons. The one reason is that often uh, when people present numbers or statistics or something like that, it feels technical and arcane and scary. And people are talking about a logistic multinomial regression or something like that. And you, can, you can't quite remember what that is. And what is a Z-score? And damn it, I, I'm just not going to even engage. So that's, that's kind of one reason. Another reason is just that, is that numbers feel very authoritative. They feel objective. They feel like they're coming straight from nature. They feel very different than the sort of, you know, subjective uh, world of human words and emotions and things like that. And so often we feel like if someone comes in with numbers, we feel like we can't challenge them because there's these uh, truisms that the data don't lie. But the data are used in the service of lying all the time. And uh, there's a lot of latitude in how they're presented and so on. So I think, you know, for us, numbers if people come to the table with numbers and statistical methods and things like that, it's really a form of power uh, that they're exercising against a listener or reader and saying, I have this authority that you essentially can't challenge because numbers are objective because you don't know the math because we're not trained um, in school, in college, even to really question numbers the same way we're trained to, you know, take some of uh, Kant's ideas and bang them against Hume's and try to figure out, uh, try to figure out who was saying what and what what makes sense and so on. Yeah, just to add to that, right before the pandemic, literally a month before the pandemic really hit, I was doing part of my sabbatical in Australia. I was at the University of Sydney, and right when I got there, I was asked to do a podcast interview, a little bit similar to this. And the interview that happened right before me, so I, and I wanted to listen to this because I wanted to get a sense of the kinds of interviews that were given. Um, they were interviewing, I won't give the name because I don't want to put the, push this person uh, you know, under the bus. They, they work for a company called IBM, so you might uh, know of that company. They, uh, this individual said, numbers don't lie. In fact, numbers never lie. But it was essentially exactly what Carl had just said, numbers don't lie. Um, and for a data company like that, that's something that you would want to, to push. That's exactly what we're trying to do in this class is say that, yes, numbers can be convincing. And they, there's good reason why it's given authority. A lot of people will, will listen up when numbers or charts or statistics are given because of many times it is quite informative. But there are many times when it's not. And people that want to use it as a vehicle for persuasion do it effectively because they know that it is convincing, that it is also intimidating. Someone like myself who teaches classes in machine learning statistics, Carl and I have been doing, you know, playing with numbers in, in our research careers and, and before that our whole lives. And yet I can admit fully, I get intimidated when I see certain new kinds of analyses put forth in a paper I'm trying to review or a paper that we're reading in class. They are convincing and for good reason, because they can be helpful um, but, and, and they can be intimidating. The problem is a lot of times they do lie, um, sometimes nefariously and sometimes not. And so the whole point of the class is just to empower people, to push back on that power and, and help students, older people, younger people, people with research backgrounds, people with non-research backgrounds to be able to ask questions and be able to interrogate that data in the same ways they interrogate other kinds of information. Because hopefully uh, by doing that, by asking those questions, this, the holes start to become more and more salient, um, and and sometimes you'll see through that uh, that kind of numbers bullshit. Our next question relates to Goddard's law. We have to measure lots of things every day, but some of these are multifaceted, like success, which makes them difficult to measure objectively. Sometimes we over optimize for one aspect at the expense of others. Can you discuss Goddard's law and why it's important to critically evaluate metrics that have become targets? Sure. So, uh, you know, Goodert's Law, I mean, I, I'd like to think of Goodert's Law and Campbell's Law as two closely related ideas. And, and they're both, they're both, you know, originally said in these rather, rather complicated ways, but can be phrased very clearly. So Marilyn Strathern describes Goodert's Law as saying, when measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And so the idea is that when a measure becomes a target for people, people figure out ways to work the system, to game the system, to, to score high on whatever it is that is being measured. And so that no longer measures whatever you were trying to measure in the first place. Campbell's law then goes on and says, you know, goes even further. It says when a measure becomes a target, 
Um, you know, not only is it a good, is it no longer a good measure, but people do stupid things in the service of trying to game the measure. And so, you know, uh, what happens when you try to, you know, hold teachers accountable, so to speak, for for their teaching? And so you say, um, you know, I want to crack down on those teachers that aren't doing a good job. So we're going to institute state standards, and we're going to have a state standardized test, and we're going to take funding away from the bottom ten percent of schools or whatever it is. And so the way people respond, of course, is first of all, people teach to the test, so the scores on the state standard tests are no longer particularly good measures of how much the kids are learning. But then the stupid thing that they do is they then spend all all year teaching to this dumb test that they're going to give at the at the end of the year instead of actually teaching the students anything. So it, it sort of pulls everything downhill. Devin, you want to add? Yeah. To that? So imagine if we were to um, come up with a metric to evaluate the quality of podcasts like this one, and we couldn't come up with a great metric. We know that's hard. So we just say, okay, how much bang for the, your buck can you get? And so, uh, you know, shorter, shorter podcasts because people have short attention spans and then how much information you get. Then everything, then what, we, what would you see, you know, you know, a year down the road, if there was monetary reward for that, or at least. It'd be TikTok. Yeah, it would be TikTok. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it would happen. But that has nothing to do with the quality of the podcast. But that's a that's a metric that tried to answer a tricky question that doesn't have an easy metric. That's the problem. Yeah, if you could find a metric that could, could truly evaluate the quality of podcasts and there's one metric, platonic metric, and that's all you need, then fine, it would work. But almost never are you able to find that metric that captures, you know, the complicated behaviors or complicated things like the quality, let's say, of, of a podcast. And so that's why it always shows up because people come up with a metric like a university ranking. Well, you got to choose something. Well, so let's choose class size and let's choose research dollars and, and alumni dollars and some of those might have some uh, relevancy to a university, but they're not going to capture all the other uh, untangibles. And then before you know it, all they care about universities is making class size small or at least appearing to look small and all the other things that go with metrics. And so that's the problem that, that we have with metrics. And the reason why it relates to ex exactly numbers and things is because we, again, this is a class about reasoning with data. And a lot of times these metrics are based on data, which really are flawed if you're trying to measure the quality of the university or podcast. Goodard's Law and Campbell's Law really screwed us uh, here in the United States during the pandemic. It's one of the obvious measures of how well we're doing in fighting the pandemic is the number of cases that are that are taking place, the, the epidemic curve. The Trump administration saw this essentially as a, you know, the, this measure as a referendum on how well it was doing at fighting this pandemic. And they recognized that the more testing you do, the more cases you find. And so they, um, you know, now it's quite clear they took a large number of steps to try to prevent widespread testing from taking place in the United States. Um, not only did that mean that the epidemic curve in the U.S. was not a very good measure of what was actually happening in the U.S., testing is a really important step that we can take in trying to, it's a tool we have in trying to fight a pandemic. And so it meant they did something amazingly stupid, which was by undermining testing, not only did we not get good numbers, but we also lost the opportunity to uh, use testing to find people that were infected and didn't know it and get them out of circulation. And, and so the spread went faster and further than it would have otherwise. So jumping off of that, do you guys have any ideas on solutions to how this problem can be solved specifically like in the public sector where you might need a metric, you know, to communicate to the public how, you know, something in this specific case, COVID case numbers are going and how to stop that from turning into a target uh, where like local governments or, you know, some other entities might be willing to change their strategy to just improve the target without improving the underlying situation. I think I think the big the most important thing we can do it's a long play of course which is just to make more of the public aware of the way in which metrics can become useless. Teach them about good arts law. You don't have to even call it good arts law because that sounds very academic and intimidating and everything. But we can just provide examples, you know, silly examples sometimes. Actually, this gets to some of the refutation techniques that we talk about later in the book and later in the class. Um, and this isn't necessarily refutation, but in, it's a teaching moment to make it sort of humorous. And then hopefully when armed with some examples where metrics go awry, at least 
you could have the public at least identifying some of the ways in which the metric might be misleading or leading to bad behavior. And so it's not that you should stop with metrics. I mean, you need, you know, if you're a, a baseball manager, you're, you, you need some way to separate whether I should have this person at the number four batting position or the number 10 batting position or whether I'm going to pay for this player, batting averages and all the other things that come with and all the other kinds of metrics outside of sports. I mean, it's not that we're going to stop doing those, but at least be aware that they don't fully capture and and to be you know, on the lookout for the ways in which behavior becomes uh, sort of it goes in the opposite direction of, of what you want it to. I think it's all about incentives. I think it's about understanding alignment of incentives of the people that are able to influence the metrics vis-a-vis the, uh, the way that the metrics are being used um, to make decisions, to reward people, et cetera. So uh, ha- having a political entity that feels judged by the metrics have strong influence over their collection is a problem. It's not just in politics or COVID. Uh, you know, I think one of the most strikingly you know, under-discussed uh, antitrust examples that I can think of is that the world's largest scientific publisher has become, um, I believe now, the world's largest uh, provider of bibliometric information. So Elsevier also runs Scopus. And uh, so the notion that they're collecting the metrics that are telling you about the value of, of their own journals is a, is a tremendous problem, and, or it has the potential to be a tremendous problem in any case. And so um, just being aware of how those incentives play out and trying to isolate them in, in these kinds of ways is also really important. Oftentimes, numbers are distilled into graphs instead of tables. And so graphs could be misleading too, right? What do you have to keep in mind when you're looking at a graph that you know, might appear in the news, for example? The most effective way of communicating numbers is typically through information visualization techniques, graphs, and the tables as well. They're a great way of summarizing what usually are complicated patterns to unveil if you're just looking at the raw data. But some of the simplest things are, are, are what we try to arm our students with. You know, look at, look at the units, look at the axes, look at the labels. Uh, we have lots of examples, um, of graphs that violate what, um, what Carl calls the principle of proportional ink. And this is this, idea that uh, the ink devoted to the numbers uh, on a particular graphic should be proportional to those actual numbers. So if you have a five to one ratio, the, the pixels of those two different things you measure shouldn't be 5,000 to one or something. And that, and that happens when you zoom in so far on a bar graph or on a, especially on a 3D graph uh, or, you know, 3D pie chart or, or various, you know, other kinds of related visualizations. So things like looking for things like that, looking for the ways in which, you know, multi axis graphs are, are sort of layer, they, they sometimes are manipulated in a way to look like there's a pattern between the two when in fact there isn't any. Look at the ways um, in which, you know, a line graph is zoomed out so far that you don't see uh, sort of the underlying patterns that you would expect to see, which is kind of the opposite of what I just said before, which is about not zooming in too far, at least with bar graphs. But there are chart types where it's important and relevant to, to zoom. And there's a whole bunch of other things. I don't need to go through all the details, but the point is that's where we see most of our information visualization, our data visualization, uh, our data is in these visualizations. So, so I think it's one of the things that we have, we need all of the public to be sort of on the lookout for the ways in which graphs may be misleading. There's an education gap here. Uh, we're not doing a good job of teaching data graphics uh, in, in high school and even in college. And that was not maybe such a big deal 25 or 35 years ago when data graphics weren't the primary way that we were communicating information in the news media. Uh, that's changed. Basically, the advent of computer graphics packages has taken us from a position where there are essentially no sophisticated graphics, even in the New York Times, to the place where we are now, where New York Times is running these highly elaborate data visualizations that are interactive, that are often, you know, showing relationships among many different variables along, uh, you know, kind of many different cuts, often in new forms that have been invented specifically for that story. And so what we need to teach people is, first of all, you know, the basics of well, how do you read a scatter plot, et cetera, what should you expect when you're looking at a bar chart, but, um, but also to understand that the data designer even if they use true numbers and accurately represent those true numbers, they've got a tremendous latitude in terms of uh, affecting the way that you feel about those numbers and the story that they seem to be telling. And so just to help people understand the, the freedom that one has to tell different stories with the same numbers, depending on visualization choices.
Yeah, and I'll just add one specific example where we need a lot of improvements, and that's in visualizing uncertainty. It's not something we've talked as much about. At some point, Carl, we should include more of it because there's a bunch of really interesting research coming out of it right now, actually out of some of the colleagues that we know here at the University of Washington. But, you know, we do a decent job in certain areas. So, like, there's uncertainty that's encoded in the graphics around hurricane paths and and there is, you know, there, you know, some charts do include confidence intervals, although we never really teach the public about what that means. Like even a lot of researchers are, don't really have great descriptions when you ask them. But I think try to better encode and, and teach the public about uncertainty, um, I think, is something that's a, an area we need to improve on as well. Continuing to talk about data interpretation, I think that one of the phrases that is often repeated in the scientific world and maybe even the world more generally is that correlation does not mean causation. What exactly could you do to avoid misleading assumptions about between correlation and causation? Let me give you an example, just a recent example that even comes from potentially some confirmation bias, even by myself. But there's been a lot of talk over the last week and actually for several years, but certainly there's been a lot of talk recently around the relationship potentially between SSRIs and uh, some of the school shootings. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they're a class of, uh, of, uh, of antidepressants. Including right. Jack, uh, Luvox, a bunch of those. Right. And so there's been a lot of talk about the correlation between the uptake of those and gun violence recently. And, and, and it could be that there is a, a relationship, a causal relationship between those two. But wait, there's so, so, many... wait, so, the, so they're supposed to, they're, they're, the, so the use of SSRIs is supposed to increase gun violence? Is that the claim? That's, there's been a lot of talk recently, even just over the last week, about That's that. Funny. I always thought it was the guns, but okay, keep going. Yeah, <laughs> right. So exactly, exactly as Carl said, I mean, it can, it can, uh, it can very much uh, be thought of in lots of different ways. And so the idea that we're trying to um, plant in our students and the habit we're trying to create Look for common causes. Look for so in that case, it could be that people with mental health issues, you know, would need SSRI or 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 whatever. Or but then might also use guns. Uh, although there's plenty of people with SSRIs that don't don't use any guns. Um, you, but also, you know, that there's lots of other complicated ways in which that it, we could lead to to a conclusion or lead to what could be a, a correlation between those. Um, different things. But also just one thing we mentioned in our class is that when you take two variables and you pull them over time, um, especially when they're kind of both going up, you can take lots of variables and place them in in place of the other. Like you could put the increase, uh, instead of the increase of gun violence, you could put the increase of phone usage or whatever the last 20 years and SSRs. And you would you potentially see some correlation between the two. So SSRIs the, cause cell phones or cell phones cause SSRI use or something, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So the idea is, not, is, first of all, we want to communicate to the students, getting a causality is super hard, but at least be thinking of the different ways in which those variables could interact. And that might mean to lead to some experiments and to some deeper thinking and, and maybe to more plausible arrows and, and blocks because we create these block diagrams. But the idea is just not to get stuck on what and get sort of pulled in quickly because it might seem plausible at first. The idea is just to, to, to look for the ways in which these variables can interact. Differently. I think there's a few key lessons. I mean, one is to recognize that the way that the, uh, the way that a lot of information, uh, for example, for example, news about health is presented can conflate correlation and causation, as Jeff and I say in the book, you know, uh, correlation doesn't imply causation, but it doesn't sell newspapers either. And so often uh, when you get these news stories, uh, you know, actually, you know, there have been studies that have looked at this, you'll see about half of the most shared news st- stories about health things will uh, misstate correlation, uh, correlative evidence as causation, as evidence of causation. Um, so when you read uh, things that say, you know, exercise three times a week to avoid cancer, Often what that is reporting on is a study that showed a correlation between frequency of exercise and cancer rate. And and in the study itself, they say they don't know which way causality goes and that it could, of course, go different ways. So so partly it's a matter of recognizing that a lot of the ways that stories about science and health and things like that are presented to us suggest causality that we don't have good evidence for. And then, you know, as Jevin says, it's, uh, you know, the, the other, you know, this this whole huge fascinating area of statistics of, of causal inference. How do we find evidence for causation in observational data? And there's some really neat techniques that, that have been developed, you know, say in econometrics and so forth. 
And then the last one, of course, is that when we can, when we control things, this is why we like manipulative experiments. This is why we like randomized controlled trials. This is why we like controlled uh, laboratory experiments and so forth, because when you can do that, that's really the way to get a causality rather than through observational data. It's just that often we don't have that option. As a very, very quick follow-up, like you talked about, there can be a bunch of correlation in your data, but there must be a way for you to pick up something that you think might be a causation to further study. Is there a good method that you use to do that? Well, one of the things that we do in our data science class when we get one of these really large data sets is we we create one of these diagrams that they're really, really tiny uh, correlation. Uh, we basically put uh, all the variables, all the different pairings that you can do with the variable. Let's say you're looking at 10 variables. You, you look at all of them in these plots and see where there, there's high correlation. And you, you do that actually, you know, for other reasons, for other analysis reasons, because you're trying to look, you're trying to actually, like you might be reducing the dimension of your problem. So you might look at everything that has high, high correlation, you're just going to pull into one dimension because they're all kind of saying the same thing. And so you do this dimensional analysis as a way of uh, kind of simplifying your problem. And then you run in, then you start your analyses. And the reason why I, ex- I, I, I note this, because what you tend to find very often are lots and lots of things that are highly correlated. And actually how much they're correlated can indicate some things, but that the point is that you're, you're, when you get all these, it's, it's just like you, you almost always see it. And so I, I think you have to be careful, even for things that look even super high correlated, there's, there could be explanations to that. So I don't want to give some sort of, sort of answer to say, yeah, look for the thing that's most correlated and go after that. Cause we have so many examples of things that, they might be the most correlated in a large set that we're looking at, but actually they're correlated because you're looking at a time series or because you're looking at things like, you know, if you were looking at the weight of, you know, football players and height or so- something that it doesn't really tell you all that much. It's not necessarily causative either. So I, I guess the answer to your question is I don't know that just just because something has high correlation, we have plenty of things that have high correlation um, and really there's no causative agent behind it. The point is you need to dig deeper and, and figure out, come up with a mechanism for why they might be actually oh. related even beforehand. And then, and then we might get to start, get start some, somewhere. But the other reason for pointing this out is that so much of the technology that we have today that's driven by AI and machine learning is essentially doing just that. They're just, it, these machines are going in looking for correlations, and then making predictions. And a lot of times it works out pretty darn well. But if you have no mechanism, which they don't, for explaining causality from, you know, A causes B or B causes C, et cetera, then you have all sorts of examples, which we have, where machines fail. So we talk in our class not only how data can misinform humans, but we talk about how data can misinform machines that we rely on and sometimes give too much credence to. I mean, there's a lot of fancy statistical methods that you can try to use, but I, I think Jevin really nailed it there with uh, with mechanism. There's a, you know, there's we've got this saying in in COVID um, epidemiology, which is mechanism is a hell of a drug. You know, the idea being that if you if you know an underlying mechanism is operating, then that gives you so much more confidence about a pattern that you see in the data than if you've just mined that pattern out. If you look at things that are, you know you have a uh, you can create a function where you can create almost a a one-to-one determinant um, between two different things i mean there's high correlation between large data sets like like if we if we were to take like carl and i did a study one time where we looked at the relationship between what was it citations and let's say like a metric that measures you know uh, journal influence which is essentially citations over articles or you know any sort of metric that's based on citations and you look at enough of those if you look at a billion rows or two billion rows you might see a pretty high correlation in the 90 let's say you get a correlation of 0.98 or something you would think oh they're exactly tied together when in fact it could be driven by other things like in our case we talk about the ways in which you get high correlations when doing analysis of very large data sets and a lot of times it's driven by things that are not necessarily because you know, A causes B. Um, they're just correlated. Um, and so if you looked at, um, like I just mentioned, the, we mentioned this in the book, the, the, if you were to calculate the heights and the weights of all the football players in the NFL, you would get a pretty high correlation because the taller linemen might tend to be bigger individuals. But it's not that height is causing weight or weight's causing height. We know that just because weight's not going to make you taller. And, and being taller 
yes, you tend to be your way more, but it's not that height is causing that weight. A little, you know, there's a, there is a relationship there. But the point is that just because you'd see a high correlation there doesn't necessarily mean that there's, you know, a causative element as an explanation. Well, for example, I mean, you could, you could, you could look at the revenues and the profits of various companies and see you've got a very high correlation between revenues and profits of various companies. And you say, wow, profits go up as revenues go up. So what I really need to do is just is try to maximize, maximize my volume. And that would be a really stupid conclusion because, because volume is, a, is, is, a, is this common factor in each of those things. And you'd be interested in profit ratios. And things like that. That's a good example. I like that example. Kind of tying into this, you know, like one of the ways people are exposed to these like false causation arguments are through uh, popular figures in the media who cite scientific papers as, you know, some source for some kind of wild claim. But sometimes, you know, these claims of uh, causation versus correlation are in the papers themselves. So what are some techniques that our listeners can use to try and uh, assess the legitimacy of a scientific paper that they might not know too much about? This is really hard. I mean, it depends on whether it's in the news or not. If it's in the news... Um, you know, for like the COVID stuff, I think the most important and you know, simplest and most important thing to do is to find trustworthy sources and go with those trustworthy sources. And there's a few different possible uh, routes of finding those. The easiest and the best, I think, are to find the very top journalists that report in this area that are scientists, you know, science journalists that specialize in infectious disease. People like Helen Branswell and Kai Cooperschmidt, uh, they know everyone in the field. They understand what's going on. They can put things into context for you, and they do. And they, you know, they'll never take a paper, report on a paper, uh, talk to the authors, and then not ask other people that know what's going on. So, you know, finding people who really know what they're doing and have reason to be object, reasonably objective, and and so forth. I think that's the top thing to do. You know, you can also, if you can, you know, if you're if you're a Twitter user or whatever, you can find the Twitter accounts that you can trust. Um, it takes a little bit of doing, but, you know, some of the top uh, research scientists are spending a lot of time um, doing public or quasi-public, uh, you know, kind of Including advanced. Including Carl public. right here in the room? No, no, no. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking like Trevor Bedford or somebody like that. And, you know, you can, you can look at what they have to say as well, but, um, and, but that, that does take a little bit more legwork. But, I mean, I actually think that, like, really good science journalists are invaluable for this. Absolutely. And speaking of that, Carl, as I was driving in just before this interview coming into campus, Mark Lipsich was on NPR uh, doing some public uh, oh, service. Right. We're yeah. talking about his new institute at the CDC. It's Mark is a, actually a professor at Harvard. Uh, well, was, I think now. Oh, he, he is, still is. He's, still, he's, he's still at Harvard. He just got yeah. this institute predict, uh, predicting, uh, you know, the next outbreak is kind of the goal of this new center, I think, spun, uh, the, through yeah. the CDC. Anyway, I, I would I'd say what Carl said is, is absolutely right. Find these individuals that you trust. I mean, not everyone's going to get it right all the time. But I want to mention something kind of interesting here. It's, it's based on a research paper I'm hoping to submit here pretty soon. And it's this idea that the consensus, sort of the social construction of consensus in, in like the scientific literature, very often <laughs> doesn't uh, play out that way in the public. I mean, of course, climate change is the most obvious one. But if you look at masks, for example, and you look back at the literature, I've done this uh, actually o- over the last, let's say, five years. There's there's pretty, I wouldn't say 100 percent consensus, but you could you could claim it's consensus within the literature that most of the research has shown that masks prevent infectious diseases, respiratory ones. But if you look at then conversations, and we can do that with some of our data, we can look at the the millions of interactions on social media, Twitter in particular, and you can look and you see that there's kind of two consensuses that have formed. And so the question is, how is it that you get this one consensus in the literature, and then you get essentially two almost equally sized consensuses? (laughs) I'm probably misusing the word. There's lots and lots of explanations, and that's part of what the research paper is about, is explaining how you get from one consensus in the literature to two different ones. How does that happen? And by the way, Many of them cite the same papers. There's a famous McIntyre paper. McIntyre is one of the more famous researchers that has done respiratory work. And this researcher has shown where masks are effective and and in some cases not effective. But you take the same paper, the two different groups on social media in, in public discourse are sort of citing the same paper. And that happens a lot where you can get research done right. But if you cherry pick articles to support your point in a way that makes it look like that's consensus, you, you can effectively do that as well. But also what's interesting in this, these conversations is that we're seeing a lot of, a lot of people re- referring to, well, there was no random control trial. There was no RCT. And, and I think that's a good start. But that's now even been weaponized to sort of counter other articles that haven't done RCTs, as if RCTs is the only way to do research. Well, it turns out mechanism being a hell of a drug. If you believe in the germ, yes, 
disease and something's a respiratory virus, then I don't necessarily need an RCT to convince right. that masks are a good bet. Exactly. Of course, the golden standard in the science, and if you're trying to get a causality, is something like a random control trial. But now that that's been a term, that you're, there's even hashtags, lots of references now to RCT, that now it's, again, either you know, weaponized is probably a little too strong of a word, but it's, no, it's not. but it's been overused now to take down large parts of science, when, when in fact, most people that track the literature realize that most of the literature, by a large margin, is not RCT. And there's various reasons for that, expense and the ethics behind doing an RCT and clinical research, and they're really darn hard. So you don't take down all the literature just because it's not an RCT especially in some of the observational studies, when you have to look retrospectively, maintaining the randomization becomes very hard. Very hard. Very hard. You're totally right. And I wish it were easier because we could get a causality more easily. But yeah, we, we just don't have that luxury. And so then we rely on other methods and just, you know, some common sense and good betting, like Carl said, too. If people don't feel comfortable uh, directly calling someone out on social media about like these false misleading claims, what are some other things they could do to slow the spread of misinformation? Actually, I think the best way is, if you have the luxury of time, is to talk to someone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, first of all, I do think that we should be doing this. And Carl is an example of someone who does this, you know, really well. And it's not easy. I mean, Carl, I, I, I guess I'm speaking for Carl here, but he gets a lot of personal attacks, a lot of threats a lot of times for the work that he's done, um, you know, talking about COVID over the last couple of years. And so, you know, it's a really important task that needs to be done. But if you're not, let's say, an expert like Carl is in epidemiology, there might be other things you can do. I mean, you certainly could talk to that person individually. You can curate lists yourself, um, being careful, sort of. You, everyone can be a journalist. I mean, that's the, the beauty of the technology of, you know, Web 2.0 is that you can be a journalist. You can curate. You can call out some flaws. And you can do that in ways that's um, both empathetic and, and not being too confrontational, but I don't even want, I actually, being confrontational is important in, in some ways. But we talk about this in our last chapter of the book, where we, we talk about how you go about doing it. First of all, it can be really intimidating. And you're putting a lot on the line when you, when you do that. But if you're going to do it, you better, you better be right, first of all, and, and you better be clear. And you better make sure that, you know, it's not you being, you know, the one making the mistake. And, and don't just, just try to question people just to question people. You want to actually, you have a goal in mind, which is to make the world smarter. And so, you know, and then there's lots of techniques for that. But I mean, if you saw it on social media, I mean, yes, respond uh, if you're willing and can make sure you got it right. And then also what you can do on the side, not just to an individual article, but it's to, to do some curation yourself, you know, write when you can do some journalism yourself, put together the articles that, uh, that, that you think represent the literature the best or, you know, call out some of the articles that have flaws or, or have holes in them. You know, I, we can all do something. And, and I, I hope that people will, because that's what it's going to take to clean up a lot of the mess that we see out in social media. Yeah, I think, you know, that's, it's, to rec it's to recognize that social media is a medium where we all are broadcasters. We're all sharing information. And so, you know, yeah, sure, you can call people out if you want to, but actually, you know, we're all also part of the problem. And so if you're not comfortable calling people out, you can more, take more focus on on what you're doing yourself and try to make sure that what you're sharing is accurate and useful and just be a, just be a positive, you know, try to be a net positive part of that ecosystem. Um, even if you're not, you know, getting in big online, you know, streaming matches with idiots, you can, you can still, uh, you know, you can still just make sure that you're, you know, helping inform your friends and family in a positive way. And, and that, that goes a long way. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go, uh, put myself on a Zodiac between a whaling ship and a whale, but I can still like make sure that I eat dolphin safe tuna, you know, and, and, and that helps. Power to the people that are out there in the Zodiac, but it's, it's not going to be me. Right. Yeah. But the thing that Carl and I talk a lot about in its most simplest form, and that's to any, any age, any person in society, is just think more, share less. I mean, just think a little bit more, share a little bit less, stop feeding those algorithms with things that we haven't vetted. And actually you start to see this. I took a screenshot a couple of days ago. Twitter actually got me to say, Hey, before you share this paper, I was about ready to share a paper, but I had already read the paper, but it didn't see that I linked on the paper. It was a paper from a student that used to be working on my lab several years ago, who's now got her own lab. Um, so I, I already knew about the paper um, and I was ready to share. And Twitter's like, are you sure you want to share it? It was a little annoying, but at the same time, I think it's good 
but the, the best thing we can do is just think a little bit more, share a little bit less. Think more, share less. Along those lines, can you speak a little bit about how people can use back of the envelope calculations to spot exaggerated or misleading claims? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk a lot about Fermi estimation, which is a great way to, um, to quickly come to conclusions. Even if you have access to a computer, just the exercise of Fermi, which is basically working through a problem uh, in powers of 10, uh, rather than trying to get the exact number. So if you wanted to know, you know, how many people, we, we use this example in one of our case studies in class, how much money is lost to fraud um, in our welfare system, uh, to, you know, to the food stamp program. And you could figure out, okay, how many people are in the U.S.? How many people, you know, might be on food stamps? How much do you think they're given per year, et cetera, et cetera. And you go through this, but you don't try to get the exact number of people. You don't try to get the exact amount that they would spend or be given by the government per, per month, uh, the people that are on food stamps. You just need to um, estimate a power of intense. And it works remarkably well. The physicist that it was named after Fermi himself was boy, he was, you know, a lot of the predictions he made literally behind a, a napkin, at least that's how the story goes. Maybe it's an urban legend, but at dinner, he would do these kinds of calculations. And then all the other scientists would go to work for the next six months and basically come up with the same calculation about the, uh, I guess, the explosive potential of some, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't even be able to describe exactly what they were trying to calculate, but he was really good at it and he used this technique. And so doing these kinds of quick things is, again, helpful for testing the plausibility of, uh, of some sort of argument. A great rule of thumb is if something seems too good or too bad to be true, it probably is. Almost, geez, it's amazing how often that, that proves to be true. Really important. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about how to, how to sort of upgrade your bullshit detector. I mean, just simply using that rule as you read anything um, <clears throat> is so powerful. And maybe combining that with uh, recognition of your own uh, you know, pre-existing biases. So using that to catch yourself on, on, uh, on, in terms of confirmation bias, you know, if something's too good or too bad in the direction that you already believe is the case, um, <clears throat> then it probably is. So if you're really scared of COVID and then there's a really, really scary story that comes out, um, you know, even though you're scared of COVID and trying to convince everybody else that it's really bad, that really scary story is probably too bad to be true. Um, and go take a careful look at it, and, and hopefully, hopefully you're correct there. So, I mean, I think that's a super powerful rule. Thanks for the wonderful conversation, Professor Bertram and Professor West. We all really thank you. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a pleasure hearing from our guests today about misinformation and how to build skills to recognize it. We highly recommend reading their book, which is informative, funny, and written for a general audience. Carl and Jevin and many others do great work that's relevant today, and we've seen in the last few years how damaging misinformation is to the health of society. Check out our show notes for links to Carl and Jevin's profiles, their book, and several other resources on sharpening your bullshit detector. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for the next Sit and Listen podcast.